I'm speaking about as as uh, Clement has uh, indicated to you is uh, titled Prophetic Dialogue as Approach to the Church's Engagement with Stakeholders of the Technological Future. I don't know if you can see me on the screen or not. Uh, I can see Clement on my screen. So uh, I hope you can see me on your screen as, instead of just uh, hearing my voice. But uh, just to get into it, uh, Many experts are saying now that we are on the onset of a cognitive revolution driven by science and digital technology, especially artificial intelligence or AI. Now, this will lead to a lot of advancements in many, many areas, for example, healthcare, weaponry, transportation, and even space exploration. Now, in the face of all these drastic changes uh, and this this incredible situation. There's a quote by E.O. Wilson in 2009 that sort of captures the situation that we are in. And what E.O. Wilson, the, socio bio the sociobiologist uh, from the US says is, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. Now, the question that we're concerned about this evening is, what is the role of the Catholic Church in the face of this new revolution? Are we a sort of a medieval institution that cannot confront the situation at hand, or are we a more advanced institution than that? What I'm proposing for this evening is a framework for religious engagement, in particular, the church's engagement called prophetic dialogue, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. This uh, involves respectful and constructive conversations between the church and various stakeholders of the digital future. The central thesis that I am proposing is that prophetic dialogue will allow the church to maintain its proper influence over human development and control the impact of technological advancements on its own existence as well as mission. The general outline is as follows. I will present uh, briefly the trends in technological development and the effects of these ships on humanity. And then we will try to look at the stakeholders who will serve as the dialogue partners of the church that we will examine prophetic dialogue in context of church mission and also in context of the digital future, which we're concerned about and then we conclude. Now, uh, let's get into the trends in technological development. There's about eight or nine or 10 major trends that we can identify, and they're all actually quite interrelated. The first trend that we can speak of is digitalization. And this involves a comprehensive transformation driven by widespread use of digital technology. And it includes integration of digital tools into business processes, creation of new digital products and services, and development of innovative business models, ultimately reshaping various industries and requiring businesses to either adapt or risk becoming obsolete. The second trend is mobilization, and this entails pervasive presence of digital technology in all aspects of our life. Everywhere we go is on our body, in our hand, um, in our pocket, and it provides constant access and transforming communication work and entertainment. And this has led to the emergence of this new human species we call digital nomads, who are able to work and travel at the same time. They can live in a country that's completely removed from their work uh, uh, center and they're still able to carry on their work. And the future promises to have even more portable devices where we can use and take with us everywhere we go. The third trend is screenification. And this involves the integration of digital screens and displays in various aspects of our lives. And it's driven primarily by advancements in display technology, 
and the rise of mobile devices. It allows for real-time information, interactivity, and the replacement of traditional mediums such as billboards, bulletin boards, magazines, newspapers, uh, restaurant menus, and so on. And it provides potential for further developments like augmented vision in the future. So we may have a screen placed directly into our eye that helps us to upgrade our eye to a 2.0 version, so to speak. And the next trend is this intermediation. And this involves direct transactions and communications between parties and individuals without the need for intermediaries. And this will take place across industries such as entertainment, e-commerce, finance, and travel. And intermediate, this intermediation is very much closely related to decentralization, which uh, is the distribution of control and decision-making across a network of participants. And it offers benefits such as increased security, transparency, and innovation. But this, this uh, trend also poses many challenges because it requires a new uh, model of governance and also technical knowledge. Mm -hmm. The fundamental principle of Web 3.0 that's being developed at this time, right now we're actually in the Web 2.0 era, but Web 3.0 that's being developed is uh, to further decentralization in which uh, it uses uh, decentralized networks and blockchain technology in order to enable direct peer-to-peer -peer interactions without intermediaries such as tech companies uh, who, we, who we rely on to help us communicate with one, other or one another or make transactions. Right now, in order to communicate with each other, we need to have, for example, email, we need to have Google, Gmail, or Yahoo Mail, and, and they have the servers and they control our information. Whatever we send through their servers, um, they have our data in their uh, server. But this intermediation and decentralization means that we don't have to go through a, uh, a intermediary in order to communicate with one another. And this uh, really allows for more efficient communication and transactions. And another trend that we're also looking at is transformation. And this involves a profound change that goes beyond innovation or modification. And it occurs at the personal, social, as well as the economic levels. For example, uh, there's neurotechnology's potential to revolutionize brain understanding and communication. And there's a possibility of humans becoming cyborgs or genetically engineered for better health. Advancements in the fields of prosthetics, uh, brain computer interfaces, nanotechnology and biotechnology enables deeper integration between technology and human biology. And all of this is oftentimes driven by in the trend of intelligization, which is the in increasing integration of AI technologies into the various aspects of life. It automates tasks, enhance human decision-making, and develop human-machine interactions. The goal is to improve uh, productivity, efficiency, and innovation across industries, uh, including work, healthcare, transportation, and entertainment, just to name a few. And AI promises to help us solve various social dilemmas, for example, environmental degradation, poverty, even world peace. And for the church, perhaps in the future, the church can use AI to solve the problem of church attendance, why are people not coming to church? Automation and robotization is the next trend. And this involves using technology to optimize processes previously performed by humans. Automation uh, focuses on the software and the digital technologies, whereas the robotization specifically utilizes the hardware, the robots, but both aim to improve efficiency, productivity, and quality across industries. Now, AI technologies can enhance the capabilities of robots, uh, making them more autonomous and adaptable, 
useful, and also more human-like in appearance. The question is, do we really want the robots, the machines to look like us, and what kind of ethical uh, uh, problems that they might bring for us when they look so much and act so much like us in the future? And the final trend that I will uh, share with you this evening is anticipation. And this involves accurately anticipating future events. For example, uh, you may have an AI-powered personal assistance to help uh, predict uh, your future needs and behavior, AI doctors to foresee health issues, AI-powered tools in law enforcement to identify crime patterns and allocate resources effectively. Perhaps AI-powered tools can be used by dictators to know in advance where unrest or opposition may occur and to quell them before it takes place. And further advancements are expected through integration with the Internet of Things. Now, I'm just gonna go through and list very briefly some of the effects, one of the negative ones. Now, all we have to uh, remember that everything that's positive uh, about technology so far is true. What is advertised is true. What Facebook says it will do for you is true. What ChatGPT says it will do for you is true. What YouTube says in its mission statement is true. On the other hand, there's also another side to these uh, developments that we have to look at. And I'm just gonna very briefly go through some of these. Uh, for example, loss of privacy. If you are not the customer, then you are the product, right? This is, uh, uh, has been said many, many times before. Uh, job displacement is a real concern with old jobs gone and new jobs being created. The question is, well, do people have the ability to gain the skills in order to build the new jobs? Uh, growing inequality, most of the wealth is now concentrated in the hand of high-tech giants and tech-related industries. Social instability, there's a divide between the digital have and the digital have nots. And I'm just not talking here about uh, internet access because internet access is really just a short-term problem. Right now, of course, there are more than 3 billion people who don't have access to the internet, but this can be solved rather easily in the coming years. But what happens in the future when certain people have access to nanotechnology that can help them to live longer, to have better intellectual skills, and the ones who don't have access to these services? And will there be two or three different uh, classes of biological humans and transhumans? Uh, dependence on technology, the implications for mental health and civic governance. Environmental impact. Uh, uh, digital uh, technology uses a lot of natural resources, a lot of energy. Uh, to mine for bitcoins takes up a lot of energy. So digital sustainability is a big concern uh, uh, for environmentalists. Uh, world peace, uh, AI uh, operated killer robots is being developed by countries such as China, South Korea, the US, Great Britain. Uh, this kind of technology, everybody's racing to develop them in order to uh, assert the power in the world. Uh, responsibility and accountability, who's responsible for actions carried out by machines. And of course, uh, for all of us, impact on religion. What are the implications for religious authority and practices? As we mentioned earlier, decentralization and this and then this intermediation are the trend in technology and 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 that will affect how people think, uh, affect their mindset. Now, the church operates on having authority, being the intermediary in many of the teachings and the, the, the sacraments and so on. And how will this affect the church when the mindset of the people is, is to bypass uh, intermediaries, to bypass the middleman, to bypass uh, certain authoritative uh, entities in order to quickly uh, get to uh, what they need. Now, uh, we, we may say business is not the same as the church. However, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the mental mindset that really can affect the way people think and the way people 
look at the church in the future. Now, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he's a famous author and commentator on history and also the present situation. He says, what nukes are to the physical world, AI is to the virtual and symbolic world. Now, Tristan Harris and Asa Raskin, who produced the Netflix uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma, comments that nukes do not become more advanced on their own, but AI does. So between nukes and AI, what is actually even more dangerous and risky? So in the face of this reality that I just presented with all its lights and shadows, uh, uh, opportunities and challenges, uh, perhaps it's good for us to quote Ebenezer Scrooge from uh, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol when he asked the ghosts of the Christmas to come, uh, are these the shadows of the things that will be or are they shadows of things that may be only? Now, let's get into uh, the section on dialogue. So for the church to dialogue, the church has to find out, figure out who the dialogue partners are. And so here I'm just going to also uh, name the primary ones, the major ones, uh, who will serve as the dialogue partners of the church in this digital future. The first big group, of course, is technology developers and companies. And because they uh, have a tremendous impact on technological development and the direction. However, their making decision is based on profitability and growth, and their interests may not always coincide with the common good. The second major group is governments and regulatory bodies because um, they shape the future of technology. They implement policies, laws, and regulations um, that guide and control the development and use of technology. And they also have the responsibility to ensure social responsibility, democratic governance, and stakeholder interests are also supposed to be taken into account. The third group is, is huge consumers and end users because they drive te technological development with their needs, uh, preferences, and also growing awareness of social and the environmental impact of technology in their lives. Uh, consumers and end users uh, reap both the benefits as well as the harmful consequences of various technological advances uh, that are uh, uh, introduced. The next group is communities and society at large because um, they shape the future of technology uh, by transforming various aspects of human life and they can also emphasize the importance of considering the social and ethical implications of the technological development to ensure its positive impact on, posit on society and address concerns uh, such as inequality, privacy, security, and job displacement. Another um, set of uh, dialogue partners include um, environmental organizations and also other advocacy groups. Environmental organizations uh, can raise awareness, advocate for sustainable practices, and seek government regulations uh, to address potential uh, positive as well as negative environmental impacts of advancing technology. And finally, religious institutions and adherents, so other religious institutions besides the church as well. Um, religions has to navigate the impact of technology on religious practices, beliefs, and traditions. And across religious traditions, uh, there are many who express concern, but others embrace digital technologies as ways to spread the message and also to connect with uh, followers globally. So there are people on both sides uh, in their view of technology. Now, Now let's look at the prophetic dialogue a concept. And uh, first of all, let's look at it in context of the church mission. Um, if you were here for the last lecture, uh, uh, Roger, Roger Schrader uh, had uh, spoken about this concept as well. And this concept was 
that the term itself was initially mentioned by Michael Amaladas, an Indian missiologist, sort of in a bypassing manner. He didn't really uh, uh, discuss much or delve into it. And then this uh, term was, uh, was uh, formally recognized as a significant missiological concept at the 2000 General Chapter of the Society of the Divine Word. Uh, uh, those of you here who are SVDs would know this. And then later on, it was further developed by SVD theologian Stephen Bevins and Roger Schrader in their various books and articles. Now, if you Google uh, prophetic dialogue in mission now, you will see that it has gained acceptance among authors from diverse denominational backgrounds and not just SVDs and not just Catholics, but also in uh, other uh, denominations as well. Now, what is prophetic dialogue? Uh, Stephen Bevan says, uh, prophetic dialogue is both theology and practice, and it requires deep listening to the movement of the spirit, uh, deep reverence for the context in which one witnesses and proclaims the gospel, the, uh, the cultivation of a habit of contemplation, and deep conversation among whom and with whom a person or a community is working. Prophetic dialogue finds its foundation in a practice of meditative discernment, collaborative examination, and theological exploration. And it strives to bridge the gap between current experiences and the profound biblical and doctrinal traditions of Christianity. So prophetic dialogue, again, is doing theology, but in very specific contexts. And so it must be discerned and undertaken by individuals who are directly involved in mission situations. So basically no armchair participants in prophetic dialogues. Prophetic dialogue is to be understood as the implementation of the overall stance of the church on mission as dialogue. And so dialogue has been recognized as something very fundamental to the mission of the church. Uh, in the Ecclesia, uh, in the uh, encyclical Ecclesium Suum, Pope Paul VI acknowledged the necessity in engaging with diverse individuals uh, and the demands of true humanity. And so Christians are called to approach the, their mission with a dialogical spirit of respect and friendship, drawing inspiration from God's Trinitarian dialogue of love. At the local regional level, the FABC, for example, has been very uh, uh, supportive and they advocate a great deal of, uh, of dialogue as the way to do mission. And as recent as its uh, assembly in 2022 in Bangkok, uh, Cardinal Charles Bo, who's the current president of FABC says, we realize that dialogue has become not only relevant, but also indispensable to a world that has grown more fragmented and prone to violent conflict. Now, how is dialogue prophetic? The SPD uh, general chapter document says dialogue is considered prophetic because it allows us to recognize the presence of Christ and the working. Sorry. Uh, dialogue is considered prophetic because it allows us to recognize the presence of Christ and the working of the Spirit in all people leading to self-reflection, conversion, and witnessing to God's love in the face of prejudice, violence, and hate. Now, dialogue is prophetic because it's not a neutral position that we dialogue from, but we dialogue from a position rooted in our own faith with the aim of hearing the voice of the Spirit and moving forward, uh, and that makes our dialogue prophetic. How is uh, the dialogue uh, effective? A prophet's effectiveness relies on some of these characteristics. 
attentive listening, community dedication, direct involvement in community life. And because of this uh, involvement and dedication, the message is always rooted in the reality and the needs of the people. The message is expressed boldly and passionately and, and is expressed out of a genuine care and concern for the community. If you were here last time, uh, Roger Schrader also mentioned this. There are two categories of prophetic message. Uh, Bevins and Schrader uh, uh, calls them speaking forth and speaking out or against. Now, speaking forth, uh, Schrader calls annunciation. Uh, Walter Brookman, a Protestant theologian, uh, would, would characterize this as energizing speech. Whereas speaking out or against, uh, Schrader calls denunciation. And Brookman would call this criticizing speech. Now, I'm going to use uh, Brookman's uh, ideas here to describe what energizing prophetic communication entails. Energizing prophetic communication has the transformative power to energize individuals, instill positive attitudes, and inspire hope for a future characterized by new realities and genuine change. And it liberates us from the belief that change is merely just a rearrangement of existing patterns. Rather, it empowers us towards repentance, courage, and resistance against destructive forces. Criticizing prophet, prophetic communication, on the other hand, cuts through the numbness and self-deception. And it challenges individuals to confront the overwhelming experience that they often deny. It emphasizes the destructive consequences of disconnection consumerism, exploitation, and oppressive systems that hinder genuine human connection and perpetuate inequality and suffering. It compels us to see that the ultimate consumerism is consuming each other and eating off the table of a hungry brother or sister, says Brockman. So, in terms of um, our topic this evening, uh, prophetic dialogue and the digital future, uh, I would classify these as the components of prophetic communication. In terms of energizing prophetic communication or speaking forth, some of the components would include embracing, collaborating, and modeling best practices as witnessing action. We know that communication is not just through words, but also through practical actions. Criticizing prophetic communication, speaking out or against, on the hand, would uh, include components such as opposing the negative mindset, calling for change, and mobilizing for accountability and responsibility. So let's sort of go through these uh, component by component. Prophetic dialogue with stakeholders of the digital future, embracing. For me, this entails, first of all, affirming the stakeholders, recognizing uh, their crucial role in shaping a future where technology promotes human dignity. It uh, entails acknowledging the value of technology itself in improving lives, uh, fostering communication, and developing the earth in alignment with God's original plan. I think many of our church documents has uh, done this in, in, its, uh, in one way or the other. Also emphasizing responsible use and discernment to separate positive elements uh, from potential pitfalls. Also embracing entails envisioning a future where technology serves humanity and society while safeguarding against harm through wisdom and moral principles. In terms of collaborating, uh, this component would entail such things as uh, facilitating encounters among various stakeholders and designing encounters 
uh, specific to the context of each group or subgroup. This is definitely something that the church is in a position to do with its reach and influence. Also, the church can advocate a technological development process that is with instead of four groups. And what do I mean by this? A lot of times, um, technology is develop developed for various groups of people, uh, the disabled or the elderly or the youth or the people in the global south or the global north with, without their input, without their opinions, without asking if they even need the technology or want the technology. Many, many times uh, technology is imposed on people and then they either, as I said before, reap the benefits or, or, the, or the consequences. So what the church can do is to help advocate for a process that, where technology is developed with these people so that they have a say in how the technology should be developed or whether it should be developed and in what directions. And this way we can uh, uh, avoid a situation that is called uh, digital coloniality, especially people in the global south. Uh, technology affects every, everybody, but a lot of times uh, people be, become sort of uh, victims of certain technological developments. And this constitutes a form of digital coloniality. And collaborating also uh, here is the church can involve the lay people uh, who is part of the church's secular order to represent the church in dialogue. Uh, as it was said before, dialogue, uh, prophetic dialogue involves people on the ground in the situation. There's no other people more on the ground than the lay people in terms of technological development. The church has 1.3 billion members and many, many, many of them are on the ground involved in researching, innovating, and distributing technology. And we need to enlist uh, their cooperation in this dialogue in order to affect change that, that the church would like to see for the future. And so this involves the church as an institution or through the lay people, uh, through the advocates, uh, the allies of the church uh, to co-research, co-create, and co-design technology that is human-centered. And the third component is modeling best practices. And this involves the church or individuals inside the church uh, resisting the temptation to be prophets of doom and gloom or creating false or unnecessary moral panic. Also setting examples of utilization of God's gifts by church leaders and pastoral agents in ecclesiological governance, pastoral outreach and evangelization. So modeling best practices to inspire positive trends in technology use and counter divisive, destructive and dehumanizing practices. And the church can also draw insights and highlight insights from the laity and secular organizations that have harnessed technology for promoting life, addressing environmental issues, uh, combating hunger and alleviating poverty and so on. In terms of criticizing prophetic communication, uh, the first component is to oppose the technocratic paradigm and scientism that attempts to sideline religion as legitimate stakeholders. There's a mindset uh, that somehow the church and religion in general used to be very influential and very effective in innovating and discovering and affecting the development of technology and science. But through the years, um, this has changed and the, the church has sort of fallen off the scientific train. And so Right now, the church is just passive recipients of technology. And so the church needs to really resist the portrayal of religion 
as outdated and irrelevant in scientific and technological development. We know that religious institutions, especially Catholic institutions, continue to play a significant role in supporting scientific progress and research through our universities and institutions worldwide. And, and a lot of Catholic universities contribute uh, to state-of-the-art research. So we need to also dispel this Western-centric myth of inherent conflict between science and religion. The Catholic Church, as we know, celebrates scientific discoveries and recognizes the value of religious beliefs in inspiring and guiding scientists. The church has a framework and a reflective capacity that aids in understanding the social and spiritual implications of scientific advancements. And so through um, this way, uh, the church can advocate for a holistic approach to development that prioritizes human dignity and the common good over narrow economic interests. And the church also needs to point to the limitations of science and upholding the value of diverse forms of knowledge and inquiry. The second component in this dialogue with stakeholders of the digital future is to call for change to directions in technological development that perpetuates unjust structures. And this entails engaging with the partners to address the ethical implications of technology. We know that every new technology innovation brings new advantages, but also presents potentially previously unknown responsibilities. For example, prior to the invention of the Kodak camera in 1888, um, the concept of rights to personal privacy was not present. This only became an issue, personal privacy, after the camera was invented. And so every new invention or innovation puts or presents new challenges and opportunities. And we have to seek out these uh, challenges in order to address them. And the church needs to also call upon the, the, those who are responsible to address these challenges. And so the church can st strive to raise awareness, encourage ethical technological development, and advocate for policies uh, that reduce inequalities and ensure human dignity and also environmental sustainability. And one of the things that it can do is to support initiatives to bridge the digital divide and promote education and training, such as in the STEM fields uh, and also other fields as well. And the third component uh, here is to mobilize for accountability and responsibility uh, by the entities for innovations and ways of implementation that are unethical, uh, devalue human integrity. And we can also say death building rather than life giving. So anything can actually be evaluated on whether it deals that uh, life, it gives life or it's death building. And so in doing so, uh, the church can raise awareness and publicly condemn technologies that compromise human dignity. Uh, the church has many uh, means in order to raise its voice. And so it needs to do so uh, when this is necessary. Also, the church can utilize its extensive network to educate individuals about the negative consequences of unethical technology and advocate for regulatory measures to hold tech industries accountable. In terms of witnessing action, the church can provide support for those affected by techn technological displacement through social service programs and vocational training. But there are many uh, entities within the church that can support in this kind of practical uh, uh, work to support the victims of technology. And also the church can utilize pastoral programs to promote responsible technology use, um, internet safety, to educate people on, on digital literacy and wisdom, and also to promote digital citizenship. And also to advocate for a culture of discernment and reflection to promote a digital humanism where technology is made for humanity, not humanity for technology. And so in conclusion, 
Prophetic dialogue empowers the church to actively engage constructively in conversations about technology, recognize the expertise and interests of stakeholders, to collaborate with the various dialogue partners to ensure technology upholds human dignity, to advocate for and participate in positive developments, to, un uh, to address unjust structures, to promote ethical considerations of te technological development, and also to help shape a digital future where human innovations benefit all and serve the common good. I think that's all I have for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to hearing uh, your input. I think instead of uh, people raising questions and then I answer them, I think it might also be good if uh, uh, those of you who are here also to voice your own uh, opinion and also give your input as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony, for the beautiful presentation. And uh, as we all know, this is a reality. And even at the moment, the medium by which we are communicating is what you're talking about. So it's very much with us everywhere. And uh, friends, if there are any inputs or any questions, any clarifications, Anthony is ready. I think there in the chat, there was something from Charles. But I think it's more of an input. Maybe you can read it for everybody, uh, Clement. Okay. okay, so according to Charles, the reality of technology is new. And mission expressions such as prophetic dialogue is also new. But lived application of gospel as mission is not unlike the methods of the Cardine over Cardine over 100 years ago facing industrialization or action reflection from Latin America, facing military dictatorships. Importantly, both led the world set the agenda. Charles, would you like to, to maybe yeah. expound a little bit upon that input? Sounds very, very interesting. Is Charles still with us? What yeah, is? that's me. Okay. My technology is not very good. So that's why I wrote my piece there. I thank you for bringing a new issue before mission people. I'm a Columban priest. And Sean McDonough in Ireland is also following the same track as you are. So Sean McDonough. Uh, my main interest is that we receive an attitude of formation so that we can approach whatever the problem. So that's why Cardine, I believed, formed young people to respond. Latin America, they formed communities to respond to the agenda they were that was confronting them. So to me, the method of formation to confront AI and its developments is the most important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Charles.
Jeez. <laughs> Any other questions or input? We have people of various uh, generations and also experience joining us here. So maybe you have your take on this topic as well. Anthony, uh, I must commend you for this presentation. And I really enjoyed how you are positive, you know, about the whole thing. Uh, whereas talking about prophetic dialogue would have been more of confrontation. Uh, I really enjoyed how you also talk about affirming, acknowledging, and also emphasizing what the technology developers are doing. Perhaps from there we can start a conversation. And I think uh, this is something new for me. I haven't looked at it from that point of view. Wow. This is powerful, yeah. Yeah, well, I think a lot of times when we hear a prophetic dialogue, we tend to think uh, that it's something, like you said, confrontational or tends to be a little bit negative. But remember, in the scriptures, um, the prophets didn't just, uh, you know, uh, tell people that, you know, they're going to die or they're going to uh, uh, be punished. Many times they were also consoled by the prophets, right, in their times of suffering. When uh, the Israelites were in, in exile, the prophets uh, uh, consoled them and to, to help them to withstand um, the suffering until uh, the better day is to come. So, so prophets can also be very affirming uh, as well because they uh, um, uh, Isaiah gave us a vision, right, of of a uh, of a future, a peace and harmony. Uh, so, so, from, so prophetic dialogue does not have to be confrontational, but it it. It can be confrontational in a respectful way when when it is needed, right? Thank you. There's a message. Yes, I think a message specifically to you. Uh, this is from Charles. And according to Charles, he spent most of his life in South Korea, and he knows you will enjoy your immersion there. Oh. Yes, thank you, uh, Charles. And Korea, by the way, has one of the highest internet penetration in the world. Uh, so uh, it's a very digital, digitally advanced country, uh, especially in Asia, but also in the world as well. Any input or questions uh, that uh, others might have? If you have questions, uh, you can put forth and I or the other participants in this uh, in this uh, talk today can also give their opinions as well. Uh, Anthony. I have uh, another question, just asking for your comment on the, uh, you know, people talk about the digital ministry nowadays. It's like online ministry and Pope Francis, I think, it's got the group of young people who are the uh, like digital evangelizers. I think that's uh, one of the uh, possibility for the future for, for mission, you know, like um, kind of... Uh, the mission field now is also like the digital world is beyond like geographical settings you know even in brisbane i think there's a paris priest for 
for the digital prisoners in Brisbane. I think so. Yeah, there's one Paris Pierce appointed for the digital prisoners. It's kind of uh, the possibility for the future. But also, I think maybe it could uh, kind of, um, you know, we have a, a Paris as geographical Paris, you know, in 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 our uh, ministry. Maybe in the future, you know, think about, or I don't know, the possibility of the the online, the digital Paris. You know, there's no the real one, but it's a group of people online only, and they have their own spiritual guide or Paris priest, you know, whatever, you know, this kind of possibilities. What do you think? Do you have any comment on this? So uh, I think what you were referring to earlier with the uh, uh, the, po the uh, digital communicators, uh, you might be referring to this initiative by the Dicastery of Communication, where uh, in the last three years they have been uh, a gathering uh, young uh, communicators from various countries around the world. And uh, each cohort uh, comprises 16 young people ages from 25 to 35 across uh, different countries. And this is the third cohort that they have established. And this year, the Dicastery of Communication is focusing on the young communicators from Asia and Africa, whereas in the previous two cohorts, um, uh, it was more widespread. And uh, the uh, purpose of this initiative is to train uh, young people in, to be able to communicate the faith uh, in the digital uh, context. And, um, and this was recognized uh, by the dicastery as something that was very important, especially due to the increasing prevalence of the use of digital technology, especially social media um, in, our, in our lives. And this uh, initiative came out during the COVID-19 pandemic in which uh, social media became one of the primary channels that people communicated with one another. And actually, I've been privileged to be uh, to serve on the steering committee of this initiative for the last three years, and uh, I'm also actually giving them a talk uh, in October on something similar to uh, what I presented this evening, but sort of tailored uh, for this group's uh, situation. Now, in terms of what you're saying about the parish. Uh, uh, online parishes and so on. And that's already uh, been happening. Uh, digital churches, digital faith communities, um, uh, this has already been happening. Now, what we're also looking forward to is perhaps uh, if, uh, if uh, Mark Zuckerberg is ever successful with the metaverse, is that we may have a church in the metaverse where people may attend services as their avatars. And then and this would also be very um, challenging for us to also deal with in terms of, okay, how is this a real church? Can, if you attend service as an avatar, have you really attended church? Now we don't have a lot of, now we, we can say that, okay, if you're online in, in your, in your, um, uh, in your living room and attending mass, this is just uh, and this is an online mass. You're not really attending mass, but if you're in the metaverse where you're interacting with people, and and it feels very real, and and the communication is very real. It's just not a one way communication. It's actually two way communication, uh, like what we are doing now. It's a two way communication, but as your avatar, where it feels very real, then have you attended Mass, uh, even, even though you may have not received the Eucharist? So these are the questions that I think uh, maybe we don't have answers, but this is why I think the dialogue is so important because the, real, the church needs to sort of get out of this danger of being a medieval institution. And like many of the other 
institutions in, in the world, whether it's the political, economic, or other uh, secular institutions, the danger is that we still have this uh, sort of medieval institution mindset that, and, and then we don't, we don't confront or address all these scientific and technological issues that are uh, really, really advancing at great, great speed. And if we don't, if we're not active, we're not proactive in dialoguing with all the various stakeholders, then we really may be behind in addressing the things that need to get addressed uh, before it's too late. Okay, Anthony, there's a question from Charles. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Charles, not Charles from Malaysia. <laughs> uh, Charles yes. is asking, do you envision any formation program, exercises or whatever to help believers actively engage in technological profiting dialogue? So any program or exercises that would help form people for dialogue as you're talking about today? Yeah, well, first of all, the first thing we need to do uh, on many, many different levels is to uh, address the issue of communication because dialogue is essentially communication. Uh, now, uh, the thing is, are our, our, our seminarians, who are future, who future church leaders being taught communication uh, adequately, you know, uh, are, uh, are priests and religious uh, receiving ongoing formation in communication? I mean, the, uh, the Vatican initiative that I was, say, I was telling about is, uh, is aiming to train young communicators in the digital age to uh, be uh, uh, communicators of faith. Uh, and that's a very, very specific program. Now, is this communicate, is, is this training of 16 co people in one cohort enough for what we are facing? No, we need many, 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 many more programs like that on various levels from the parish level to the diocesan level, in the religious communities, and, and to multiply throughout the whole church. Because if we don't have this massive uh, cohort of communicators, we cannot, uh, we cannot counter all the negative communication that's happening out there. Because, for, because studies have shown negative communication. That means communication that tries to uh, enrage people, that tries to uh, uh, instigate hatred, you know, gets shared uh, six times more than peaceful communication. So, and a lot of these misinformation and disinformation is being shared by bots and bots, you know, like I said uh, before, you know, um, they're, they're just automated, right? They don't need to sleep. They don't need to rest. They don't have maternity leave. So they can just work all day and night. Now, if we don't have our communicators in massive numbers uh, doing the communication that is uh, necessary, it, uh, then, then, then we just get, you know, just out numbered massively by the negative communication. So really uh, the programs, the workshops uh, that Charles is referring to, it has to start with uh, the, the parish levels. And I think the model of the, the initiative of the dicastery of communication can really be multiplied in, 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 in all levels of the church. The thing is, if the, if the parish level or the religious communities or the seminaries, uh, if they're really, really interested, they can certainly seek out experts to develop these communication programs. And I think dialogue starts with communication. And if we don't have the communication training, we cannot even speak of dialogue. 
Thank you, Anthony. And we move to our next question. Uh, and it's from Peter Luan. He says, some predict that in the future, uh, about 50% of jobs will be taken away by, he calls it AI, but maybe robots. In the result- Artificial, artificial intelligence. Yes. In the result, there may be uh, joblessness everywhere, and then problems arise. If this is the case, what can the church do for those jobless people in terms of ethical issues that might arise? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Peter. Uh, as I sort of mentioned in my presentation, the church actually uh, is uh, has many, many uh, social support programs, right? Uh, for example, uh, uh, Caritas International is one of the biggest charity organizations in the world and the church uh, has many, many vocational training programs. So uh, def definitely the church can utilize its many social support programs to help those who may lose jobs as a result of uh, artificial intelligence and also to, in, uh, to integrate new vocational training uh, a curriculum into their vocational schools and, and other social support institutions to help uh, with, uh, with the training and the retraining of individuals. Because we know in the past, if you worked on a farm uh, in your rural hometown, and one day you decide that you don't want to be a farmer anymore, you can move to the city and get yourself a job in a factory. And it doesn't take much time to change uh, between working on a farm to working in a factory with some new skills. But in this new milieu, digital milieu, it's not going to be so easy to uh, to lose a job as a factory worker and gain and get a new job as something else because the skills that are needed for the new jobs will be very very. Uh, complicated and different. And so I think the church can definitely uh, uh, start thinking about how to utilize its uh, social support uh, institutions and programs in order to help with the people who lose jobs as a result of these new changes. Any uh, any input from others? I'm that's just one opinion of mine. Uh, I'm sure others may have uh, thinking about these questions as well. Any further questions? Uh, any inputs? Mm -hmm. Charles? Okay. <laughs> all right. So since we've exhausted all our questions, I know there are there may be other questions, but Perhaps, okay. Peter has added a few things. Okay, so Anthony Peter says, thank you for your response. However, the issue here may go further to the moral problem, to the moral problem that may arise Peter, do you want to uh, to maybe uh, speak a little bit more about what you mean by moral problem? Thank you, Father. Uh, what I uh, want to ask is that uh, when many people uh, have nothing to do, no job, so. Uh, there will be uh, some sort of problems 
because they are free. In Vietnamese, we have a uh, proverb that uh, um, it's escaped my mind. When you are free, you may think of evil things. Uh, you may uh, uh, you have too much uh, too much uh, free time. And you have nothing to do. In that case, uh, evil thoughts might come. So in the in, in that case, uh, are we prepared uh, and minister them? Besides uh, uh, what you have said, that uh, we have caritas uh, uh, to support them in which of training them for new jobs and other things, but in moral uh, issues, what we, uh, we can help them in case they have nothing to do. So, so you're you're thinking that okay. Let me let me see if I understand what you're saying right. So, with uh, increasing technology, uh, people are going to lose jobs, and when they lose jobs, they will have a lot of free time on their hand, and when they have a lot of free time on their hand, they they may start thinking about um uh, about terrible things or bad things and that might might lead to uh to moral social uh problems uh in the world is that is that what you are uh kind of getting at yes i think uh, that is what i'm trying to say well yeah i'm i'm not i'm not sure if I'm not sure if the premise that pe that people don't have jobs and then they're gonna be idle and then they're gonna start uh, doing terrible things, uh, I think many people are going to be idle, are, are gonna lose jobs and they're gonna find out how to get themselves a job and they're gonna be migrating to various places in order to find work and they're going to turn to different institutions and organizations to to look for jobs i think i think people who are who have families and who have responsibilities and need to put food on the table will try to figure out uh, things or ways in order to get food on the table and to feed their children so i don't think they might be as idle as we imagine that they might be uh, and i'm not as maybe concerned about the evil that they might cause as the evil that the, the technology companies and the innovators uh, might uh, cause with uh, with you know uh, ill-advised innovations so but 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 of course there will be people who are victims of the job displacement and I, as I said at the church, and various secular institutions need to collaborate. And this is where dialogue is so important is because it's just not religions, but also in collaboration with various uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations to support and help people who may be victims of job displacement so that once they are, they can get themselves uh, back into the workforce and then to find uh, uh, food and and money to uh, for their family, and so that they won't be so idle and cause problems for society. You got it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you, Father Peter. Uh, if there are no other questions or inputs, we may. And our lecture this evening.
But thank you very much, Anthony. It's been enlightening for some of us. And as somebody rightly said, it's been challenging, but also helping us to step up because there's more and I think the future is brighter than <laughs> gloomy. Yeah. So friends, before we leave this evening, uh, I would want us to take a note. Uh, our next lecture was supposed to be the 19th of August, but then there has been a time, sorry, a date change. So instead of 19th of August, the next lecture will be the 22nd of August. And that will be Steve Bevins. So kindly take note, 22nd not 19. So thank you friends for coming tonight and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next lecture. So before we go, say a prayer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it was in the beginning, beginning is that so it shall be well without that end. End. Amen. Right. Thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you so much.